Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We have finished doing almost all the problems from this book. If there is any math problem that, you, that gives you trouble, that you wish to watch the solution of, you will find the solutions to almost all the math problems from this book from day number 251 through 400. From 251 through 400. This book happens to contain, in most cases, the exactly the same problem and appearing on exactly the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We are done doing all the problems from this book. In the event that you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. From day number 1 through 250, original solutions tend to be a little lengthier, they tend to be a little bit more in depth. Right now, we are in the process of solving quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions are a very important part of the exam, they are a big, big chunk of the exam still. Unfortunately, the newer books do not provide us with enough practice problems. For that reason, from day number 401, from day number 401, we began solving quantitative comparison questions out of this book here, the 10th edition of the general GRE. Right now, we are on page number 302. Please turn to it. Page number 302, problem number 11. Let's see what it has to say. Problem number 11, when it appeared in the exam, about half the people, about half the people managed to get it right, about 48%, 52% of the people, majority of the people, slight majority, missed it. We are told that height of a cylinder, height of a cylinder we are told is three times its diameter. So we have a cylinder, a cylinder such that the height of the cylinder happens to be exactly three times its diameter. So far so good. In column A, we have quantity circumference of the cylinder, circumference of the cylinder versus column B, the height of the cylinder. So what we are being asked to compare is the circumference of the cylinder with its height after having been told that the cylinder is of such a nature that the height of the cylinder happens to be exactly three times its diameter. I'm, I'm now going to shut up. I'm going to get out of your way. I want you to pause the video, do the problem yourself, and once you have finished doing it, then you will compare your work against the work that we are about to do together in a few seconds. You must always do that. You must always solve all the problems yourself first. I'll give you five seconds to do just that, to pause and unpause the video that is. Do you understand? Here we go. All right, here we go. How do we find circumference of the circumference of the cylinder? Circumference is very straightforward. Circumference we know is simply 2 pi r. 2 pi r. And height we are told, height we are told is three times the diameter. Height, height of this thing we are told is three times the diameter. So height is three times the diameter and of course diameter, diameter is just two times r. Two times r. That's the diameter. That's it. We're almost there. We see two on this, we see two in this column, we see two in this column. Let's divide both columns by two. We divide both columns by two. The two drops out. We see R on this side. In this column, we see radius on that side. Let's divide both columns by radius. The radius is going to drop out. And what we are being left is a pi in this column, column A, versus 3 in column B. And of course, pi is more than 3. The answer is A. The answer is A. Number 12. Question number 12. Question number 12, when it appeared in the exam, only 41% of people, only 41% of people got it right, 
almost three-fifths of the people who took the exam had trouble with it. Here is what the problem says. We are being asked to compare area of a square, area of a square with, we need the room, we can leave it there forever. Area of a square with perimeter 24 versus area of a rectangle with perimeter 28. So we're being asked to compare the areas of these two shapes. We're being asked to compare the area of a square versus the area of a rectangle after having been told that the square has a perimeter of 24 and the rectangle has a perimeter of 28. As always, I'm now going to shut up, get out of your way. I'll give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video. Do the problem yourself first. Here we go. Area of a square, that's pretty straightforward since it's a square, all sides are going to be equal, all sides are going to be equal to each other, of course, because it's a square. And we are told the perimeter is 24. If perimeter is 24, if you divide 24 by 4, I'm, I'm, now I'm explaining too much, obviously, each side has to be 6. Each side is 6. And that part is fixed. Nothing can change that. This is our square with the perimeter of 24. If the perimeter is 24, each side is 6, which means the area of this square is 6 times 6, and that is fixed. Nothing will change that. The area of this square is 36, and it is fixed. There is no doubt about it. There are, there are no other scenarios. Do you understand? It is the rectangle that we have to little bit more, that we have to be a little bit more concerned about because there might not be just one rectangle with the perimeter of 28. Let's see what happens here. So make up a rectangle. Just make up a rectangle with the perimeter of 28. If it's perimeter of 28, which means 2 times length plus width is 28, which means the length plus width has to be 14. Just make up a rectangle with a length plus width of uh, 14. How about 6 and 8? How about 6 and 8? There you go. There is our rectangle. 6 plus 6 is 12 and 8 plus 8 is 16 and as we can see 12 plus 16 again I'm doing it again I'm explaining too much the perimeter is 28 what's the area of this guy the area of this guy is 6 times 8 which is 48 6 is a 48 and of course 48 is larger than 36 48 is larger than 36 answer in this scenario the answer in this scenario the scenario that we're presenting here Answer in this scenario, 48 is bigger than 36. Answer here is B. Now what does that B tell us? This is where you have to slow down and think for a second. What does that B tell us? Let's take a look at the four answer choices. A, B, C, and D. What is it that we claim when we pick answer A, when we pick A as our answer? In the quantitative comparison question, when we pick A, the claim that we are making is that the quantity in column A, the claim that we are making is that the quantity in column A is always greater. When we pick B for the answer, the claim that we are making is that the quantity in column B is always greater. When we pick C for the answer choice, the claim that we are making is that the two quantities are always, always, always equal. The question here, million, million dollar question here is that, the work that we have done so far, what does it tell us? This answer choice that we be here, what does it tell us? It doesn't tell us that the answer is B. It doesn't tell us, and it does not tell us that the answer is necessarily B. But what it does tell us for sure is that, knowing the fact that in one scenario where quantity in column B happens to be bigger, it tells us that we do not know what the answer is, but we do know now, but we do know now that the answer cannot be A. Answer cannot be A because A would have meant, because A would have meant, that the quantity in column A is always, always, always bigger. But quantity in column A, column A could not bloody well be always bigger if we have found one instance when it is not. Similarly, what this B tells us is that the answer cannot be C. One more time, because C would have meant that the two quantities are always equal. Well, two quantities cannot bloody well be always equal when we have found one instance when they are not. Answer has to be either B or D. At this point, what we have to do 
is to ask ourselves, is that the end of it, is that the extent of it, or are some other weird scenario that we make that we make a think of, some weird situation out of the ordinary situation. And the weird and the ordinary, so out of the ordinary situation that I'm describing here, they're very simple to figure out, they're very simple to tackle. There are four weird numbers that you have to think of when you're doing quantitative comparison questions. And the weird numbers, the nasty numbers, the nasty numbers that you have to always think about when you're doing the quantitative comparison questions before you pick your final answer are 0, well, 0 is R the question here because we, can have, we cannot plug in 0 for a side, so 0 does not apply here, 1, negative, and fractions. They are written in this order. They are written in this order because I insist that you go in that order. It makes your life simpler. Do, in other words, do not, mess you, do not waste your time, do not mess with negatives or fractions unless it is absolutely necessary. Do you, do you, do you understand? You have tried zero, maybe zero is not allowed, maybe they tell you that uh, the quantity is positive. One is not allowed for some reason, maybe they tell you that uh, x is less than one. Uh, negatives are not allowed because they tell you. It's some, some, there are some constraints which where you cannot use uh, where you cannot use 0, 1, or negative, then and only then you use fractions as a last resort. The next in line is 1. Let's make one of the side equal to 1. Let's make one of this side equal to 1. We can't do anything here. This is fixed. This has to be a square with each side 6. This is fixed. This is not a question here. Let's make a new rectangle. Our new rectangle is going to have one side equal to 1. Well, if one side is equal to 1, we know the length and the width has to add up to 14. If one side is equal to 1, the other side has to be 13. Because 13 plus 13, 13 plus 13 is 26, 26 plus 1 plus 1 is 2. This one has a perimeter of 28. This one has a perimeter of 28, just like we are told. It has a perimeter of 28. But now the area is 1 by 13. 1 by 13 is just 13. Thir 1 by 13 is less than 6 times 6. 1 times 13 is less than 6 times 6. The area of this thing is only 13. The area of the square is still 36. 36 versus 13, now the answer is A. Before the answer was B, now the answer is A. We have conflicting answers, therefore the answer is D. Therefore the answer is D. Number 13. Perhaps I explained too much, but number 13. The way I look at it is always better idea to explain a little bit too much than not, explain, not having explained enough. Do you understand? Number 13, I'll give you two seconds actually give you an unobstructed view before I start erasing everything. Here we go. Number 13. Number 13, when it appeared in the exam, half the people got it right, half the people had trouble with it. It was 46%. We're given two equations, 2x plus 3y. We are told equals 10. And x plus 2y, we are told is equals 8. What we are being asked to compare, what we are being asked to compare is column A, x plus y versus, let's do it here, column A, x plus y versus column B, which is 2. One more time, I'm going to read the problem to you and then I'm going to get out of your way. We are being told that 2x plus 3y, let me just double check, I'm getting a little paranoid, 2x plus 3y equals 10, we are told that x plus 2y equals 8, we are being asked to compare x plus y versus 2. I'll give you 5 seconds to pause and unpause the video, I insist as always to, that you do the problem yourself. Pause the video and solve it yourself. Okay, here we go. What is going on here, listen very carefully. This will come in quite handy. If you sit there and you wasted your, and you wasted your time, quite a, bit, quite a lot of time solving the value, of, finding the value of x and finding the value of y individually, unfortunately that was not necessary. Here we have two equations. This equation equals 10, that equation equals 10. When you're given two equations, these, these equations are called, let's put them here, they are called
they are called simultaneous equations. Why are they called simultaneous equations? These equations, two of them together here, when they appear here, they are called two or more. If they give you three equations, four equations, they are called simultaneous equations. Why are they called simultaneous equations? They are called simultaneous equations because whatever value that we claim the x to be and whatever value that we claim y to be, those values of x and y has to satisfy this equation and that equation at the same time. At the same time. One more time. The reason why they are called simultaneous equations is because whatever value that we claim for x and y has to satisfy. That's how we speak satisfy means it has to work for this equation and it has to work for that equation simultaneously. Those values of x and y must satisfy both of the equations simultaneously at the same time which is why they're called simultaneous equations. Are you still with me? Now when you come across simultaneous equations, this is the payoff, so pay attention, this is the payoff, this is the punchline. When you come across simultaneous equation on the exam, 9 out of 10 times, 9 out of 10 times, whatever it is that they're asking, whatever it is that they're asking is buried in either the sum of the two equations or the difference of the two equations. In other words, add the two equations and it will get you where you want to go. If that doesn't work for some reason, subtract the two equations it will get you where you want to go. That's what it is. You don't have to waste your time solving for x and y individually. Let's add the two equations let's see if it gets us where we want to go. Now, had it been real exam, had it been real exam, I wouldn't actually waste my time adding the two equations here because you can see by visual inspection, by visual inspection you can see that if you add the two equations you will, not, you will end up with 3x, will end up here, 3x plus 5y. 3x plus 5y does not get us get us where we want to go. We want to find out the x value of x plus y. This does not get us anywhere. Now, if you tell us that 3x plus 3y equals some quantity, then of course we can divide by 3 and figure out what x plus y is. Or if you had told us that 5x plus 5y equals something, then we can divide the whole equation by 5 and get the value of x plus y. But the way it's sitting here, it doesn't get us where we want to go. So obviously adding the two equations here would be futile. Adding the two equations here does not get us anywhere. The next thing that we do is subtract one equation from the other. Let's do that, shall we? Let's subtract, let's subtract the bottom equation from the top equation. So this is positive, this is positive. When we subtract, this becomes negative. This is positive, this is positive. When we subtract, this, this is going to become negative. This is positive, this is positive, positive 8. When we subtract, it becomes negative. Change the sign immediately. Before you do your work, change the sign of each of the terms immediately. Now let's do that. Now that we have changed the sign, all we have to do actually technically is just to add the two equations. In other words, 2x minus x, 2x minus x is x. And 3x minus 2y, 3x minus 2y is y. There you go, x plus y. And then here 10 minus 8 is 2, voila. x plus y is x plus y, x plus y we just found out x plus y we just found out. I'm going to fix this thing here. I don't like it the way it looks. It was a plus and then underneath it's going to appear minus. x plus y we just found out equals x plus y we just found out equals 2. The answer is C. The answer to this problem is C. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye now.